Hi, I'm Rob Kellington, uh, VP of Warehouse and Pipeline at Trust Science. Um, of the three of us, I am the least data science-y. Um, I'm in charge of the warehouse and pipeline side, not the models and the machine learning and the governance, um, but I help package it together. Um, quick overview, this is uh, what Trust Science is. We're a fintech startup in the, um, we use machine learning models for structured and unstructured data to help our clients uh, make better lending decisions. So that's our business. We work with clients around all over North America and beyond to help them, what that one slide is, is help make credit decisions. So the purpose of our models is to develop a score and package that up for our clients. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, there we go. There we go, that's me. I'm going to start the conversation by how we operationalized our uh, machine learning pipeline service. It'll give you a framework of our, you know, our infrastructure and how it works and how the actual data science modeling plugs into that. So most data science projects and what you start with is an environment that lets your data scientists do their thing. So show of hands, data scientists here who train and develop models. Half, a little bit, half. So you're all familiar with what you need to get started. You, got, you hopefully have good data. <laughs> you do some feature engineering, you do some splitting into test and training, and you develop a model and then confirm your model, et cetera. And that's wonderful. Everyone can do that. You can do it on your desk, you do it in Azure has a solution, and Amazon has a solution, and Databricks has, a, everyone has a solution for that, and it's wonderful, you're happy. The problem with for us is we were started that way, and then how do you productionize it? How do you move to the next level? So when you start adding, well, the clients have to actually send it, use an API to send us their data and update their data and get the scores back. Um, we have to deal with the fact that when you're doing all that training, you're doing it in bulk. You, it's wonderful. You got 10,000 records or 10 million records. We have to deal with one request at a time. So how do you deal with that, the scalability issues? Are, and it's a negative scalability in a sense. Um, we need it to low latency, so the whole thing, most of our customers are asking for very quick response times. They don't want us to take five minutes for a batch job to run. It's got to be near real time. Um, clients send us differing data, and we have to be able to handle that in our processing. And we have many machine learning models. We don't just have one that generates a score. Each of our clients, and I'll get to that more, but each client will have models, and we have multiple models per client, depending on the data that we get. Um, we also had to support, you know, as I said, multiple clients. We wanted it automated CICD. We have to deal with privacy and access to data and monitoring. So that's where we came in. So that we started with some data scientists, and now we start building a team that can package it all together and make this operational. Um, so the first thing I did was I typed machine learning pipeline and hoped Google would give me an answer. They have lots of answers. <laughs> that doesn't help. So our CIO, uh, CTO made a, we, we have a lot of decisions we've made. Um, we're cloud first. We do everything we built from the machine learning pipeline was in Amazon, AWS. We have some functionality in Azure for th that meets a certain uh, workload. So we have some Azure and how do we integrate those things. We want it to be serverless. We don't want to manage EC2 instances. So we use managed services wherever possible, which is 95% of our functionality. Um, so we're highly focused on AWS Lambda. Postgres is an RDS instance. We don't manage the RDS. For queues, we're using Kinesis and SQS. We have some Fargate Dockers, which is a, a uh, managed service by Amazon for Docker containers, so we don't have to worry about the scalability or, or, and uh, starting and stopping them. We use S3 as our primary storage. Our data, we focus on JSON for data storage. <laughs> that allows us to have a variety of schemas for all of our data, so our whole infrastructure is focused on moving data around through a JSON structure. So then we put together our plumbing. And this is a high level overview. I might go back and forth to this. So if we, can I use this little laser thing? Yeah, here we go. So the, the part we care about is here, the analytics. This is it. Analytics models, scoring. That's what you kind of started with, and we built everything around this, as, and we go backwards. So we went backwards all the way to how do the clients get this data? So we have an API. We have to support, obviously, uh, like a, a, a REST API. We also have a portal, like a web portal clients can use. They can enter data. We also have mobile apps, and so all of those come in through our apps team. And 
I know the color coding is very basic, but we have a variety of streams we use to buffer between them. So we have queuing into our processing, and then the little symbol for lambda is just the code that runs. So based on the data we come, we make some decisions on what to do with the data. Sometimes the data fires off and we have our Azure services. And again, we use Kinesis on both sides to help buffer. So we can send requests, if you will, to Azure, work gets done for us and results come back to us in Amazon. And that's near real time. Um, this just represents the various data engineering work that we have to do to, you guys seeing a box around that? Nope, <laughs> I see a box on my screen. Um, this is the cleanup and processing and feature engineering and all the work that you need to do to take client data and turn it into something the machine learning models will take advantage of. Um, a lot of it is just reformatting and restructuring. A lot of it's going to add to it. We supplement data by going to third party services. Um, the, the goal of this whole set of jobs is in real, this is all happening within seconds, to take the data, decide, oh, I got enough data that I can go make a call to a third party service to supplement it. Job data, clean example. If people have given us some job information, we can go to services and we can add to that and, and enhance the feature block for it. We standardize to geography. We standardize to a lot of things. So just that, we, the symbol here meant we have queues. So sometimes we buffer between them for services that might be asynchronous. Um, but otherwise we're just coordinating all the data objects. No matter what, we're asynchronous in that no matter what data comes and if it went down this path or this path or this path, each time data, new data is available, it'll call analytics. So we have a complex process, not complex, a, a detailed map of based on the data for this client's workflow, which models can we call? So a specific, we might get one piece of data, only one model, the client can get a score based on that. But oh, more, they, now they've updated it, they've added more data. So as new data comes or we find new data, the Azure job finishes and sends us more data, we'll rescore. We'll say, oh, now we can use these other two models. And then we accumulate them with an ensemble. And then following it, we have some more cleanup jobs. Based on what the scores come up, we actually generate the report for the client. We uh, do some logging and some statistical work. For our warehouse, we're using, like I said, Amazon's S3 and Postgres. And this is just some supporting stuff. We use Elasticsearch and CloudWatch and uh, Cabana and SNS, there's some others, to do the communication between. So this all happens in real time. A request comes in and within a second and a half we'll get the initial score probably and then we'll get, as more data starts arriving, we'll keep adding to the scores and we communicate back to the client. We do callbacks so they get the report. That's our high level architecture. So the machine learning part, or the analytics part, um, and, and Ryan and Michael can talk more about it afterwards <laughs> if it's not in the presentation. But it does depend on the use case. What we've went through is a, is a complex learning process. <laughs> we started with Databricks. Databricks is a wonderful solution for those who haven't used it. It's nice. Spark based, notebook based, helps you with a lot of the functionality you want to do to build your models. And we ran that for a while. And then we realized it was going to be very difficult to integrate into that, that pipeline we just saw. They don't, they don't support that very well. It was very complex to start going down that road. So we said, let's stop that. So after, after Databricks, we started looking at SageMaker. The spark in the middle was we were learning that in the Databricks and as we went to SageMaker, which is Amazon's solution, which is similar, notebooks, Spark-based, works really well. In between, we learned that the Spark-based is a problem because it really trains well. <laughs> it doesn't transact very well. One request was taking now many seconds to fire up Spark. When you've got one record running through Spark, not so good. So your use case really matters. If, if you're a batch oriented, I've worked at a bank, they never did anything transactional. You're always running lots through. Spark is fantastic. But if you're trying to do closer to the transactional level, there is some overhead to Spark and you uh, have to be careful with that. So during this transition from Databricks to SageMaker, um, we started struggling with the Spark aspect to speed it up. Um, we tried a variety of things. We learned how to shove 500 meg of data, 500 meg of code into a Lambda that you're not supposed to be able to do. We learned a trick to do that. But we really, we were hacking to make that work with SageMaker. SageMaker we also had a problem with. Um, it's a wonderful solution. They charge you for every model. Every model. <laughs> we have lots of models. 
And so the first one we built was wonderful. They basically take your model and wrap it up and put it in a Docker container and they manage it all for you. It's fantastic. They'll start it up, they'll run, they'll bill you for it. But they bill you for it all month, not just when the transaction's through. And again, we could have a model with a client that they only send us the piece of data that runs that one model once a month, but we have to keep it up the whole month. And we got four environments. And so that became really painful. We met with Amazon and they all nodded. They're set up for, if you're running, if you've trained a whole model and you wanna run one model with a million transactions here, they'll, they're, they're great. But if you've got a lot of models, they're gonna price you to death and they have no way to turn off a Docker container while it's not being used and fired up for you. They have no way to combine them into a bigger work piece. So that really quickly hit our price limit. It just kept growing every time there's a new model. $460 extra a month, like it, we stopped pretty quick. And so we went to a custom solution. Um, the other part of it was we needed a custom solution in a sense to enhance our workflows. So what a wor we call it a workflow, and a workflow is that mapping of these data feature blocks are required or optional for this spurt model. These models together can go into this ensembler that knows how to combine them. So there's a, it's a JSON config file that we have that defines what a workflow is. And the workflow basically would be for an auto loan. If the client wants a basic auto loan in Canada, trying to be generic here, they might have five or six different models that are possible to use in the final score, depending on what data arrives. So there's this hierarchy and we have a mapping that says, I can try to run that model as long as I got this feature block or have this feature block. And some are mandatory, some are optional. And it has how we do certain kinds of formatting and then we have certain sub-models in there. So it's quite a complex thing that SageMaker was never gonna deal with anyway. So we went to the solution that, um, again, Ryan can talk about it more later, but what it does is the combination of the config files and a Lambda looking at the data, makes a quick decision, calls the models, we call a Docker-based, our ML now is in a Docker container, and so it'll do the call to that, the Docker container is in Fargate, so it'll do the scalability. If we need to run hundreds, it'll deal it in one Docker. If thousands come, it'll just scale up the Docker containers for us, so we don't have to worry about it from the Lambda perspective. Um, and it gives us our score. We also have config in there for whether there's shop explainability, which you'll learn about more, et cetera. So any questions on that so far? Is that making sense? Okay. So that's the, that's the core of our whole engine. The reason the engine exists is to do scoring. Um, the supporting systems I mentioned on it, we have an applications team that manages the API and all the data. Um, they support updates, they support changes to data, et cetera. So that, that's how we kind of use as our front door to make sure we have the data we need with our clients. They also have, and I didn't put it here, the outbound. They control the outbound to the client and they manage the, the portal where the clients can log on and see information about their scores. The data and feature, data and feature engineering team, um, their job is what I put in the middle, to get more data, add to the data, improve the data. Yeah, make it, make it so that it's closer to what a model needs than what the clients give us directly. And then the warehouse team, my team, um, we put the plumbing all together. We track the requests, we log the, any issues and errors, we provide the reporting of what's happened um, back to the client and then summarily. Other things, we, we've built it, it's fully CICD, we're using GitHub, so all the teams, um, the projects are on GitHub and all the teams, when you do a merge, that kicks off the CICD and things get auto-deployed. So we have very little, if any, manual um, intervention into moving things to production. We're zero downtime, clients are not infected. I think the last downtime we asked for a maintenance window, we were changing databases or something that we needed a, a small window, but for the most part, we can update this in real time as we need to. Um, we use a lot of config files so things can be published and then as the clients want to flip, we just flip them to the new workflow. Uh, monitoring, we mo everything in Amazon, we write, we use CloudWatch, but then we're starting to move them all to uh, um, Kibana dashboards. So getting them out of CloudWatch, for those of you in Amazon, you probably hate CloudWatch, but we've got an infrastructure now to move it into uh, Elasticsearch in uh, Kibana to monitor. And for our <laughs> alerts there, we use, we use Slack. <laughs> so, it's nice, you can publish to S SNS in Amazon and we just have an SMS Lambda that listens to those topics and can push it to Slack so that you can see when there's a problem quicker without having to wait for email. Most engineers don't like email, Slack works better. Um, 
We have what we call a research data extractor that we built. One of the problems, obviously, data scientists have is I need more data. They always want more data. And we, we support um, a front end that lets them kind of search for the data they're looking for. And it'll go find it for them and help them copy it to a research area. Um, it logs it, and we can use that to track who's looking at what data. And it can handle data from whether it's live data that customers are sending out with the last three months worth of data for a given client. Or we do a lot of batch processing that I didn't mention in here in this picture. This whole pipeline is transactional, like I said. But what we learned very early on, too, when you get batch, so a new client coming on board and they want us to help train new models that aren't in the system, we used to just give it to the data scientists and they'd go do their thing and build this wonderful model. And then it was really hard to retrofit all of this piping. So all of this piping doesn't retrofit very well if I don't know what these guys did down here when they're training. So even our training process goes through the pipeline. So what we do is we, we get client data, we map it to our API, and we run it through this whole system in batch mode. That's what this little lambda here was meant to show. This little lambda can point to, instead of being transactional, it points to an S3 bucket that could have 50,000 transactions in them. And it manages a process and goes through a separate queue. This is just a queue. And so we can run it through the same pipeline, the exact same code, so they, that when they train those new models, it's what we can reproduce. Now, you often get cases where it's new data that a pipeline can't handle. And those are exceptions, like the new data type. Fine, we'll just push it through. And then as they clean it, we'll have to retrofit those pieces. But we don't have to retrofit everything. So our batch process runs through the exact same pipeline as our production process. And that's, that was a learning that took a while. Um, so the, the research data extractor we can use to say, go give us live, da live data, or go get us this batch stuff for a client we're still developing. And they still get, go through the same system. Um, we're never done. The research data extractor is never fast enough for data scientists, so we're trying to find ways to make that better. <laughs> um, we're going to hear more about great expectations later. That's how we're monitoring uh, population drift. So great expectations is a library that lets you, once you build your model, we'll hear more, um, profile your data. So we do data profiling, but this gives us a tool to both profile and then compare to what's happening in the real world. So we're trying to integrate that into our environment right now so we can tell when clients' data is differing from what the models were trained on. Um, we use SHAP. I don't know, is that today's talk? Yeah, no, that's oh, the there's some SHAP. Uh, we're using SHAP for explainability. So how do we improve that and make it available to the clients in a way that they'll understand? And uh, we do a lot of comparisons. You know, this model, is how, this is how the client's data performed with this set of models. This is how it performs with our new set of models. How do we present that back to the clients in a more dynamic way? Right now we do it, but it's somewhat painful and it varies by client. We're trying to find a way to automate that so that clients can, eventually the goal is that, that when we develop new models in the background, we can present it to them in a way that they can make it, they can see it and they can decide when to flip themselves over to a new workflow. Because we, we rerun like their last three months. So we develop a new workflow, you know what those, that was giving you. We can automate the part of rerunning their prior three months against the new workflow and do a side by side so they can actually make this, oh, okay, I see where it would have improved and they can actually make a decision whether they're happy or not. Right now that we do that, but it's somewhat, it's not automated. <laughs> so that's some of our enhancements we're working on right now in our, in our tool. Because that's part, when you're working with clients and a variety of clients, you're always in that having to um, give them data to help them make better decisions. And a tool that lets them see the comparison is very important to them. There we go. Okay, we'll skip. So that's the pipeline. If you, at, the end of the, at the end of the session, I'll be hanging around. I'll be down there for beers. If you want to have any question about infrastructure and pipeline, give me a call. Okay. There we go. All right, so um, I'm going to talk about, so my, my name is Ryan. I'm the team lead on uh, analytics systems. So I deal with a lot of the technology in that little box at the bottom that he said everything was based off of. Um, I could, you know, I, I was asked to come up here and I'm like, I could talk about training a model, but I, this is the data science meetup. Everyone knows how to do that. So instead, I wanted to talk about something that's near and dear to me and, and the company, which is the explainability. Once you have a model, how do you know why it's making the decisions that it's making? Um, I don't really have slides, but I do have a link there. Uh, the, no, the Jupyter Notebook I'm going to is available on GitHub. So um, you can just go to that link there. But I'm going to 
just switch here because I'm a code person. I like, I'm a strong believer in, um, no, no that's, that's the opposite of what I want. There we go. I'm a strong believer in, in actually showing off and doing things um, the way I want it to be done. So uh, what I'm going to be doing here is just using nothing but open source software, uh, stuff available on PIP. Um, I'm going to train a model, and I'm just going to explain a result using SHAP, um, and then talk about some of the pros and cons of this approach. Um, we're going to be using um, a standard data set in the SKLearn data set, the load iris. Um, it's just a data set about petals and plants and trying to figure out what flower it is based on how big it is. I've done one slight modification to it. I've simplified the problem. Instead of three types of plants, I'm only, I picked one and I want my machine learning model to figure out if it's that one or if it's not that one. So it's just, is it, is it a varicy color or not? It doesn't, it's not a multi-class classification. So, um, so this is just me transforming the data, setting my target so that it's just, is it a varicy color or is it not? And I'm going to train an XGB classifier. So XGBoost is uh, an open source library. Um, it's based on the scikit-learn API, but it is not part of scikit-learn. Um, it is a boosted tree-based algorithm. I don't really have time to go over what it is. It's really cool if you're interested in it. To it. But we're going to be using that algorithm specifically. And um, split into training testing set and train a model. And then we get this array, which is the probabilities for each of our testing set that it is a varicy color. Um, okay. Uh, one of the cool things about, um, about XGBoost specifically is that these probabilities are actually taken from something called the margin. So uh, XGBoost actually, when it predicts something, it predicts between a value of negative infinity to positive infinity and then normalizes to, um, to a probability. And so on the back end, it's actually linear. Every tree in the algorithm assigns a number and it's just added, and all the trees are added up, and that's how it, go how it goes. So which is one of the reasons why SHAP works so well with XGBoost specifically is because SHAP works in linear space, and XGBoost also works in linear space, as long as we ignore these probabilities. It's really easy to get the margins. You just use the predict here, and you set output margins to true, and it gives you the same data set, just the raw margins without normalization. Um, uh, it's set to zero is set to 0 0.5. Um, cool, cool. So we're going to, I'm just going to reorganize my training set so that we can take a look at um, the raw training set. So there are the four features that we use to do our prediction. There's the probability, and then there's the margin on that probability. So this is where SHAP comes in. We, we want to understand um, of those four features, how much, how important was each of those four features to that margin? Um, if you don't know, SHAP is a game theoretic concept, um, specifically cooperative game theory, where it's attempting to take, we have five or six or n actors, and together they create uh, x value. Um, frequently you're talking about like factory workers, and you know, you have 10 factory workers, and they create four widgets. How much um, is each factory working contributing to one of those four widgets? Um, this is the whole training set, so we'll go through. Um, so SHAP is a mathematical concept, and it is an algorithm. Effectively, it's a, um, an average across all permutations. I don't want to get into the math, but math is interesting. I only have 15 <coughs> minutes. But um, effectively, it, it tries to organize it such that all values assigned to at least one actor Two actors who contribute equally receive equal value. Uh, actors who provide no value, like if you remove it, nothing changes under all permutations. They receive no value. And a couple other math mathematical technicalities like linearity and stuff like that that, once again, I don't really want to go into. Um, cool. So in short, SHAP divides up the margin and tries to determine how much of each feature it is responsible for. Um, creating a SHAP explainer is super easy. You import SHAP, you give it the model that we actually train, the XGBoost model, uh, give it the training data, and then we go SHAP values equals explainers dot SHAP values, and you get that. Um, an important concept to understand is the expected value of this one right here. So every model 
um, whether you like it or not, has an expected value. The expected value for our case is negative. And the reason it's negative is because um, in our training set, uh, the training set is fairly evenly divided between the three flowers, but we only care to train on one flower. So um, only one third of the data is what we're looking for, and two thirds of the data is not what we're looking for. So on average, the, if we were just making a random guess, we would guess that the flower is not varicicolor. And that is represented in that expected value. If we were to effectively give random data to this um, model, more, more often than not, it's not going to be a varicicolor. So we have the SHAP, SHAP explainer there. Now, SHAP works on a concept of shift. So it really is wants to figure out how data uh, deviates from the mean. Okay, so if we assume that on average, everything is going to be that negative 1.973 shift. What's interesting to us is data points that shifts it away from that. Um, that's what I just talked about. So here we go, um, just a lot of pandas reorganizing the data so we can get a nice, nice view. But what we get here is oh, a little bit... Uh, No. Okay, good. That's all I want. So once again, I reorganized it, and I'm doing the shift. So we have um, the petal width, we have the varicicolor margin, and we have the shift. So to get, so to get a margin of 3.26, we not only have to shift it away from 0 3.26, but we have to shift it away from that average mean. So it's actually got a shift value of 5.2. Um, and then you can work all the way down. So the shift value is just the margin value minus uh, the expected value on the whole model. Um, and it's that shift we're really focusing on. So when we actually generate our values, all the values are going to sum to the shift value, not the margin value. It's important. Okay. Um, so there's all the data. Once again, it's very long. Okay. So we're going to focus in on one specific example here. Um, I picked it, so we have a, a, a plant with a sepal length of 6.3 centimeters, sepal width of 2.7, petal length of 4.9, petal width of 1.8. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have a margin of negative 2.6 and a shift of negative 0.21. Now the reason I pick this one, I'm just gonna, the reason I pick this one is because, um, well, quite frankly, this model was too good, and um, this is the closest thing I could get to uh, a disagreeing. So it's got a, it's got a varicicolor probability of 10%, which means it is a, a target of zero, which means it wasn't a varicicolor, but the model thought it has a 10% chance of being a varicicolor, which in my training data was the best I could get. I was hoping for something more along the 50%, but um, that's interesting. So our question is then, okay, why 10%? Why is it 10% as opposed to zero or as opposed to not that? So we can use these shift values. Um, to answer this question. So we can say, okay, the sepal length had a shift of 0 0.89. So that's saying, okay, that's actually not super strong, but kind of strong in favor of it being a varicicolor plant. Uh, it has a sepal width of 0 0.58, which is still in favor of, the, of it being a varicicolor plant, but not very much. A petal length, that's quite strong, 1.6. But we look at the petal length, and it's got a negative 3.28. So that is completely off in the other direction. So that's telling us that that 1.8 centimeters is extreme. Like, that's just, it's ruling out this thing right, going on right now. It's very, very strong. It's, um, so we have a shift, then, of negative, which, which is basically saying that this petal width is eradicating all of the certainty that the other ones brought, that it is a varicicolor. And so we're actually getting a negative shift, which means it's less likely than average to be a varicicolor. And since on average it's not a varicicolor, it's going to predict that it's not a varicicolor. Um, Shap has an inbuilt little plot. That's nice, if you like seeing it, um, which shows it's not so great on the black background, but it's showing you know, all the various things that are effectively pushing us more towards the varicicolor thing. And then we have the pedal width there, which is pushing us back. Um, on average, we have to defeat um, the, the expected bias in the system. So even if all of the stuff was facing right, with, was green right, but not very strongly right, uh, it would still be not a varicicolor if it didn't overpower that, uh, 
the expected bias in the data. Um, so it's mostly negative. So downsides and gotchas. Um, SHAP is not a means, an end-all means to explainability. Um, one thing I like to say is that um, your model is only explainable as its least explainable parts. Um, so um, one of SHAP's downsides is um, it can't tell us why the pedal width is off. All it can say is because the pedal width is um, 1.8 centimeters, that's bad. Now, does that mean that increasing the pedal width would make it more likely, or decreasing the pedal width would make it more likely to be varicicolor? Shot doesn't tell us that. Uh, we'd have to actually look at our original training data, and we'd have to make inferences based on um, that's relationship with the rest of the data. So we might need additional tools or additional analysis to figure out that. Um, so in some situations, we want to know that, oh, this person, you know, in, in a real world example, this value is not high enough, or this value is too high. Um, unfortunately, SHAP doesn't tell you us that. Um, the other downside of SHAP is that um, it assumes independence of your variables. Um, so one of the things I like to say is, let's pretend sepal length and se uh, let's pretend you know, we had a variable in there, sepal length, and another variable five times the sepal length. They're 100% correlated. SHAP doesn't know that. So SHAP is still going to divide the push, but because they're effectively both the same variable at the time, you're going to get two push values out of the same variable. So what you're end up going to be doing is splitting that value between two values, and what could be your strongest predictor is now appearing as two weak predictors. Um, and so you have to be careful about that. And it gets even more complicated when you have partial, um, uh, sorry, partial correlation, um, because um, you know there might be signal that is interacting with another signal, which is their, so their stealing SHAP effect, because it's all linear. Uh, gaining of SHAP value on one side is a loss on the other. So if you have partial correlation, well, there are independent components of those variables, but the dependent component, which could be you know, a third variable, is shared between the two, and you're hiding your, um, and you're hiding your um, uh, uh, predictivity. And so once again, you're under or overestimating the predictivity of a thing based on uh, dependent variables. Um, and the final one is um, SHAP can't help you if your features themselves are not explainable. So if, you, if we were to have pushed this thing through some super hyper advanced genetic learning algorithm that automatically generates features and we have one feature that's the sum of these features divided by the sum of these features and the square root all over another feature over there, it, SHAP is useless. Because um, it's, it's going to assume all of them are independent, it's going to assign SHAP values, but because all your features are just intermingled and, and, gen and, and together, then you're going to see a SHAP value of a feature that even you don't understand what it means, which means nothing. So suffice it to say, we might use a generator for feature generating algorithms as an experiment, as something to learn, but in any production model, um, every single feature themselves needs to be um, you have to be able to defend it. You have to be able to say what it is. You have to be able to defend what it is. Because um, once again, if the feature itself is not explainable, then assigning a SHAP value to it is an is a exercise in futility. Um, yeah, that's really all I've got. So, yeah. <laughs> Yep, I can bring up the slides. So the good thing is I'm here to actually, if I may say, normalize our brain. So, because it's not that easy giving a presentation after listening to that math heavy talk, right? So, but anyway. Okay, so now we've, we've all listened to Rob. Like, he, he, he explained how the moving parts, everything are connected together, right? And we just listened to, uh, to Ryan. He talked about explainability and things like that. And the question is actually from governance perspective. Does that mean we can actually trust what is coming out of the pipeline, right? So we have sharp. Well, you really did a very good job trying to highlight the limitations and things like that. 
So for a moment, let's try to pretend that the limitations are actually unknown to us. Or probably even there are limitations for those limitations, right? And the question is, can we trust what is coming through the pipeline? And uh, let, let's assume that we can even trust it to some extent. Uh, when you now go to the business side, like is the business ready to actually adopt the solution that you're proposing? And that's where governance actually comes in. Well, you might be saying, well, if your, uh, your, your pipeline is really nice, modern day technologies and things like that, and then you have interpretability, explainability, and things like that, then you can trust the, uh, what is coming out of your pipeline. But well, you have to wait until you start seeing things like this. Well, for, for a moment, you might be looking at the dollar values, like the lawsuits and things like that. But at least we are all human beings. So I believe we have some emotions. So when you read through all these scenarios, then I believe that uh, there is a call for us to actually, especially those who are like core uh, machine learning developers, to actually bring some humanity into what we are doing. Like, you know, like uh, Ryan mentioned, if you, it's, it's more like a garbage in, garbage in, garbage out, right? And uh, one of my favorite quotes is actually, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So, well, that's where governance comes in, because we try to actually find the model that is very, very useful, and while also trying to minimize any uh, uh, impact that it could cause to, to humans or to humanity. So for example, when you look at this last uh, example now, so we see some variables there. So for those of us who are like legal students or who are familiar with uh, legal interpretation of discrimination, so one of the things here is that, so we have disparate treatment and disparate impact. Well, if you look at this particular company, one would expect that all these variables or discriminative variables are not being used in the model. So it's possible that they are actually exposed to are using proxies in the model, which can actually explain some of these protected attributes. And again, because we have just, uh, I have limited time, I'm not gonna be able to, to say more about that. But at least the question that we're trying to answer in governance is to make sure that the model or the products we're actually developing is fair, is accountable, and also transparent. And when we're talking about transparency, right, then it requires us to actually understand what is going on under the hood. You know, when we want to compare like modern day uh, governance with let's say traditional governance or traditional uh, 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 data governance in particular, what you do is probably you just have some checklist and then you check the boxes or the data is coming in, blah, blah, blah. But this goes beyond that because we really want to understand what is going on under the hood. Like when you make decisions, there are a lot of assumptions, like for example, in our pipeline that uh, Rob showed, right? So we have the apps team that is trying to get all the data coming from the, uh, from the clients. Then in between, we have the warehouse team, right? And then we have the data engineering team that, do, that does uh, was a feature engineering and all those things. Like even if you provide the same set of data to let's say two different data scientists, because of their own uh, 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 possible bias and things like that, it's possible that they actually decide on using different set of features, right? So all those things need to, uh, we actually need to hold them accountable. I know data scientists, uh, you really don't want to hear that, like uh, you, you don't want to hear about documentation and things like that. But if you're uh, uh, making, uh, developing models that will actually impact lives, and it is really, really important that we hold people accountable. We need to really understand what is going on under the hood. So, well, maybe for you to actually really understand, people talk about black boxes and things like that. Well, I think I saw most of us eating uh, pizza, right? So let's say for a moment, the objective here is that we're really hungry, we're thirsty, we're hungry, right? The objective is clear. And then at the other hand, you know the performance is if you eat something, then you're going to uh, feel that hunger, right? But you don't know what is going on. So uh, I saw uh, Irene or uh, Masa, uh, Masin uh, uh, giving us the pizza. So let's pretend for a moment that the pizza is covered in something. We don't know what is going on. Now the question is, would you still eat the pizza? Yes. Oh, really? <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> your response was too fast, so I'm not really sure you're going to eat. <laughs> so that's it. Let's, let's try to think, because you will want to understand what you actually want to eat. The same thing that is going on here. So when you look at it, so 
let's say, okay, the business objectives are clear. We know what the, the data, uh, uh, the business discovery, everything is, right? And then when it comes to like the performance, we know, we understand how, what we want to monitor and things like that. But then the question is, as far as the product or the solutions we're preferring impact people, impact lives, if we don't really understand what is going on, this, is, this has gone beyond just checking boxes. We really want to understand the assumptions and the limitations of your model. Even though you have nice, with due respect to, to Rob, the way the warehouse guy, so you have the nice pipeline, your architecture, everything looks nice. I still really want to, I want to understand what type of data is flowing through that pipeline. Because for example, so let's take for example, if you have a business that says for, for all good reasons, you want to just uh, focus on, let's say single models, right? And then you come to, uh, let's say trust science, that, oh, we're developing model for single models to solve this particular problem. And then you apply that same uh, model to a different purpose. Now, by the time the model is in production, right, we're going to start seeing data that are actually different in terms of like the profiles from what the model was trained on. And then coming from governance, and again, when I say governance, I really try to differentiate data governance, but focusing more on AI machine learning governance because I think that actually encompasses everything. So we really want to understand how those different data sets actually shift in different environments, right? Okay, so I'm glad you all agree with me that you wouldn't eat the pizza. So now, <laughs> so that means that we, we actually need some transparency, right? So for a moment, you know, I decided to still make that AIML black, unless most of us are, 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 are Ryan carbon copies, probably, we don't really want to see all these sharp codes and all those things, right? And even when you think about the business, because one thing I also see for uh, governance, like I also see myself and the team as an advocate for the client also, right? So I am, um, like from my experience, I'm very sure that the clients, they care less about all these sharp values and all those things. We still need to find a way, even having understood the limitations, we need to find a way to put it in a way that will be easier for them to understand, adopt, and also implement, make decisions on it. So that's why that part, I still think for a long time, unless, I don't know, like there'll still be some gray area or black area there. So here, yeah, when you make decisions, classification, regression, clustering, different things like that, for me, especially like uh, if you're coming into governance, you should be able to at least understand how these models actually make decisions. And I try, though, again, this is not really about explainability or interpretability. I also try to differentiate between interpretable models and explainable models. Though I really want to understand why my model makes that decision, then the question is also how does it make the decision? At least for governance, we really want to understand that, right? And uh, so you have the data side, the quality is very important, uh, the quantity is important, other things are important making sure that we have the right data. For example, if you come back to the business world, right? So as, as soon as we start seeing shifts or like population drift in the data that starts coming in, right? On, in the business environment, then that's probably a good time to start having conversations with the model developers or even the business to really understand how some of these decisions could actually impact their business going forward, right? And like I said, it's really, really important. And the reason I'm actually emphasizing this because uh, Irene said earlier that uh, we're hiring for AI, ML, uh, governance engineer, right? So I try to emphasize that so that we really understand the business we are in. We're not in the business of just checking boxes. It's we're actually, if I may say, in the business of trying to understand or trying to hold all these guys accountable. Warehouse guy, the uh, what's it called, data engineering guys, everybody, including Ryan and Mr. Martin himself. Okay. Now I just try to make this uh, so that you actually really understand how we implement some of this in uh, how we put them in pr into practice in uh, 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 at trust science. So what I try to do here, at least for AIML governance. So again, just leveraging from what uh, Rob presented. So I try to look at it as expectation governance. Expectation in the sense that when the business comes to you, you have some requirements, some discovery went into all those conversations, right? So I, as much as we're trying to solve the problem, right, there must be some level of agreement. 
as to what problem we all agree that we want to, uh, to solve. And also the data, so we need to really agree on the type of data because as soon as the, the, I mean, things happen, we're talking about realities now. So if there are changes, that is part of the uh, 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 things that we actually want to put controls uh, uh, out for so that we actually govern that. Then when it also comes to data, so things can happen that, well, maybe the data could, things could happen from the warehouse. I'm not saying it's happening at Trust Science. Trust me, it's not happening. But let's say from the warehouse side or even from the business side, but at least we should be able to actually trace the logs of the data. Because oftentimes, probably, uh, 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 there are situations where there will be some requests coming from the client, right? And they really want to understand why it's different from their own business practices. We should be able to give them uh, satisfactory explanation. And that's why the data governance piece is also really important. And that covers warehouse data engineering, right? And then uh, when it comes to the analytic systems, and that's algorithm governance, we need to really understand all the sort of decisions that go into the features, right? Though from my experience to date, uh, they, an average data scientist does not really want to have that conversation. It's all, oh, I, I made the best decision. It's predictive. Well, well, predictive. So let's say now you have a very nice machine learning pipeline. You have your sharp explainability and all those things. And then you have a very good model that says that uh, for US, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, politics now, like males have less than 90% chance of always being the president. Okay. Well, that's good. But then when you look at the historical biases in the data, then you might actually see that your data, sorry, your model is actually useless or even pointless. So when we want to have that conversation or that dialogue with data scientists, well, again, that's where you really have to, uh, you know what, bring, bring your, your uh, what's it called, business side. And it's not always that easy, but at least it's a conversation we need to have to really understand what decisions they make uh, as, as long as the decisions actually impact our people. And the last thing is the apps team, though they are actually like they have the apps development side, right? And then, so when it comes to like the performance, we want to monitor the performance of the model. There are a lot of reasons why we monitor the performance, but one of the key reasons is that as soon as the expectations start changing, because imagine that like initially we, we're, we're controlling the expectations or we're governing the expectations. As soon as it starts changing, uh, it starts changing in the real life, then what happens is that we should start initiating conversations with the right teams so that at least we try to mitigate or minimize any possible impact that those decisions can have on, on people. And I think with that, I've come to the end of my presentation. And I think uh, Ryan actually made a very, very good uh, 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 comment that it's better to actually have all the uh, all the questions at the end of the presentation. I really like the quote, you know, like when I was just thinking, I said, okay, you know what? Govern your dragon or it shall govern thee. So I think that probably applies to, to Ryan. So you're sharp, you have to govern it. Otherwise, you know, interesting things can happen. So with that, I've come to the end of the presentation. <laughs>